afternoon, everybody, uh, all the participants, all the panelists. Uh, you know, let me start by just acknowledging that uh, we have seen in the last several weeks, last few months, uh, the kinds of epic uh, changes and events in our country that uh, are as profound as anything that I've seen in my lifetime. And I'm now a lot older than Plan. I'm uh, going to be 59 soon. Uh, and, and let me begin by acknowledging that although all of us have been feeling pain, uncertainty, disruption, uh, some folks have been feeling it more than others. Uh, most of all, uh, the pain that's been experienced by the families of uh, George and Brianna and Ahmad and Tony and Sean and, and too many others uh, to mention, uh, those that we uh, thought about during that, that moment of silence. Uh, and to those families who've been directly affected by tragedy, uh, please know that Michelle and I and the nation grieve with you, hold you in our prayers. Uh, we're committed to the fight of creating a more just nation in, in memory of your sons and daughters. Uh, and we can't forget that even as we're confronting uh, the particular acts of violence that uh, led to those losses. Uh, our nation and the world is still in the midst of a global pandemic that's exposed the vulnerabilities of our healthcare system, uh, but also the disparate treatment and as a consequence, the disparate impact uh, that exists in our healthcare system, uh, the unequal investment, the biases, that have led to a disproportionate number of infections and loss of life in uh, communities of color. So uh, in a lot of ways, what has happened over the last several weeks is uh, challenges and structural problems here in the United States uh, have been thrown into high relief. Uh, they're the outcomes not just of the immediate moments in time, but uh, they're the result of a long history of slavery and Jim Crow and redlining and institutionalized uh, racism that uh, too often have been uh, the plague, the original sin of our society. Um, and in some ways, as tragic as these past few weeks have been, as difficult and scary and uncertain as they've been, uh, they've also been an incredible opportunity for people to be uh, awakened to some of these underlying trends. And they offer an opportunity for us to all work together to tackle them, to take them off, to change them. Uh, America and, and make it live up to its highest ideals. Uh, and part of what's made me so hopeful is the fact that so many young people have been galvanized and activated and motivated and mobilized. Uh, because historically, so much of the progress that we've made in our society uh, has been because of young people. Dr. King was a young man when he got involved. Cesar Chavez was a young man. Malcolm X was a young man. The, the leaders of the feminist movement were, were young people. Leaders of union movements were, were young people. The leaders of the environmental movement in this country and the movement to make sure that uh, the LGBT community uh, finally had a voice and uh, was represented were young people. And so when I want, when when sometimes I feel despair, I just see what's happening with young people all across the country and the talent and the voice and the sophistication that they're displaying. And it makes me feel optimistic. Uh, it makes me feel as if, you know, 
this country is going to get better. Um, now, I, I want to speak directly to the young men and women of color in this country, uh, who, as Plan just so eloquently described, have witnessed too much violence and too much death. And too often, some of that violence has come uh, from folks who were supposed to be serving and protecting you. Um, I want you to know that you matter. I want you to know that your lives matter, that your dreams matter. And when I go home and I look at the faces of my daughters, Sasha and Malia, and I look at my nephews and nieces, I see limitless potential that deserves to flourish and thrive. And you should be able to learn and make mistakes and live a life of joy without having to worry about what's going to happen when you walk to the store or go for a jog or are driving down the street uh, or looking at some birds in a park. Uh, and, and, and so I hope that you also feel help, hopeful, even as you may feel angry, because you have the power to make things better and you have helped to make the entire country feel uh, as if this is something that's got to change. You, you've communicated a sense of urgency uh, that is as powerful and as transformative as anything that I've seen uh, in recent years. Um, I want to acknowledge the, the folks in law enforcement that share the goals of reimagining policing because there are folks out there who took the oath to serve your communities and your countries have a tough job, and I know you're just as outraged about the tragedies in recent weeks uh, as are many of the protesters. And so we're grateful for the vast majority of you who protect and serve. I've been heartened to see those in law enforcement who've recognized, let me march along with these protesters. Let, let, let me stand side by side and recognize that I want to be part of the solution. Uh, and who've shown restraint and volunteered and engaged and listened because you're a vital part of the conversation and, and change is going to require everybody's participation. Um, now, when I was in office, as was mentioned, uh, I created a task force on 21st century police, uh, policing in the wake of uh, the tragic killing of Michael Brown. That task force, which included law enforcement and community leaders and activists, was charged to develop a very specific set of recommendations to strengthen public trust and foster better work and relationships between law enforcement and communities that they're supposed to protect, even as they're continuing to promote effective crime reduction. And, and that report showcased a range of solutions and, and strategies that were proven and that were based on data and research to, to improve community policing and, and collect better data and reporting and, and identify and, and do something about implicit bias and in, in, in how police were trained and, and reforms to use the, the force that police uh, deploy uh, in ways that uh, increase safety rather than precipitate tragedy. And that report demonstrated something that's critical for us today. Most of the reforms that are needed to prevent the type of violence and injustices that we've seen take place at the local level. Now, reform has to take place in more than 19,000 American municipalities, more than 18,000 local enforcement jurisdictions. And so as activists and everyday citizens raise their voices, we need to be clear about where change is going to happen and how we can bring about that change. It is mayors and county executives that appoint most police chiefs and negotiate collective bargaining agreements with police unions. And that determines police practices in local communities. It's district attorneys and state's attorneys that decide typically whether or not to investigate and ultimately charge those involved in police misconduct. And those are all elected positions. And in some places, they're police uh, community review boards with the power to monitor police conduct. Those oftentimes may be elected as well. The, the bottom line is, I've been hearing a little bit of chatter in the internet about voting versus protest, politics and, and participation versus uh, civil disobedience and direct action. 
This is not a either or. This is a both and. To bring about real change, we both have to highlight a problem and make people in power uncomfortable, but we also have to translate that into practical solutions and laws that can be implemented and we can monitor and make sure uh, we're following up on. So very quick, uh, let me just close with a couple of specific things. What can we do? Number one, we know there are specific evidence-based reforms that if we put in place today, would build trust, save lives, would not show an increase in crime. Those are included in the 21st Century Policing Task Force report. You can find it on Obama.org. Number two, a lot of mayors and local elected officials read and supported the task force report, but then there wasn't enough follow through. So today I am urging every mayor in this country to review your use of force policies with members of your community and commit to report on planned reforms. What are the specific steps you can take? And I should add, by the way, that the original task force report was done several years ago. Since that time, we've actually collected data in part because we implemented some of these uh, reform ideas. So we now have more information and more data as to what works. And there are organizations like Campaign Zero uh, and Color of Change and others that are out there highlighting the, uh, what the data shows, what works, what doesn't in terms of reducing uh, incidents of police misconduct and violence. Let's go ahead and start implementing those. So we need mayors, county executives, others who are in positions of power to say this is a priority. This is a specific response. Number three, every city in this country should be a My Brother's Keeper community because we have 250 cities, counties, tribal nations who are working to reduce the barriers and expand opportunity for boys and young men of color through programs and policy reforms and public-private partnerships. So go to our website, get working with that because it can make a difference. And, and, and let me just close by saying this. Um, I, I've heard some people say that uh, you have a pandemic, then you have these protests. Uh, this reminds people of the 60s and the chaos and uh, the discord and distrust uh, throughout the country. I have to tell you, uh, although I was very young when you had riots and protests and, and assassinations and discord back in the 60s, um, I know enough about that history to say there is something different here. You look at those protests, and that was a far more representative cross-section of America out on the streets, peacefully protesting, and who felt moved to do something because of the injustices that they had seen. That didn't exist back in the 1960s, that kind of broad coalition. The fact that recent surveys have showed that despite uh, some protests having then been marred by the actions of some, a tiny minority that engaged in, in violence, that despite, you know, as usual, that got a lot of attention, a lot of focus, despite all that, a majority of Americans still think those protests were justified. That wouldn't have existed 30, 40, 50 years ago. There is a change in mindset that's taking place, a greater recognition that we can do better. Uh, and that uh, is not a, as a consequence of speeches by politicians. That's not the result of um, you know, spotlights in news articles. Uh, that's a direct result of the activities and organizing and mobilization and engagement uh, of so many uh, young people across the country uh, who put themselves out on the line uh, to make a difference. And, and so I just have to say thank you to them and, uh, for helping to bring about this moment and just make sure that we now follow through. Because at some point, you know, attention moves away. At some point, 
protests start to dwindle in size. And it's very important for us to take the momentum that has been created as a society, as a country, and say, let's use this uh, to finally have an impact. All right? Thank you, everybody. Proud of you guys. Uh, and uh, I know that uh, we're going to be hearing from a, a bunch of people who have been on the front lines on this and uh, know a lot more than I do about it. Proud of you.